Hi, I'm Elaine. I'm going to go through a brief overview of operating systems, trying to cover as much as I can in a short as possible video, just to give you an overview. Starting with the bootstrap process, this starts off the operating system. This does all the initial work, loading from read-only memory, in order that it can actually load the full operating system from the larger physical memory, random access memory. So the bootstrap process is what happens when you first run the operating system. I'll just quickly open up my virtual machine, virtual box manager, and click on one so that you can ac actually have a look at it starting up and running the bootstrap process. It's not very interesting, I'm afraid. It is literally just a black screen with some white or green text, depending on the choice that they've made. And this is just looking at the read-only memory, looking at what devices are installed and the hardware and loading all the required files and data in order to run the rest of the system. So this takes a little while. It's a little boring, like said. There is an error there, but it's nothing that's going to stop my system from working. So this is where all of the loading is taking place for the operating system as said in order to actually get it into memory and give you a login and that's now booted up it's not very interesting some systems will actually give you a whole load of data on the screen but this one was very quiet unfortunately so i've now just logged into that it does take a while to set up because i've got another one running in the background as well so i have ubuntu there and obviously I'm running Windows as well on here. So once loaded up, you have the usual access to folders and files, or you have your terminal where you can type in your commands. So there are many types of operating system. Linux is a very popular one that um, I use quite regularly, different distributions. You have Android on your mobile phone or iOS on your Apple phones and Apple tablets. You have operating systems in your car and on other devices. And obviously the most obvious is your computer and your laptop. Even many TVs have an operating system now and consoles and TV boxes like your Skybox. So there's many other types. In terms of computer science, you might want to look at the different types for, from a theoretical perspective, in, including distributed and real-time systems as well. So what does the operating system need to do? Well, it needs to manage all your files, all your programs, the memory, and the memory is used to temporarily put your programs and data whilst they're running or while something's being done to them. And of course, present you with the user interface. So there's a lot of work going on there. In terms of files and memory, I'll just give you a quick example as we go through using my uh, Ubuntu Linux. In terms of the operating system, Microsoft and Mac come with their own integrated GUI. You don't, you often don't get a choice, although you can upgrade them to to upgrade the interface on the Mac more often than you you might do on on Microsoft. Linux, you get a choice of GUI when you install it, and you can add more later if you wish or remove the one that you have. Both operating systems offer you a command line interface. For example, this is the MS-DOS command line in interface where you type your DIR to look at the directory listing and you can look at files, open files, copy files using the copy command. So copy file one, file one to file two, but I'm not going to do that because I don't have those files. So you can use the command line interface on there and you also have the same thing on your Ubuntu, so or your Linux or Unix. Apple Mac also has a terminal window that you can use, so LS. That that's instead of DIR. So on Windows it's DIR, on Linux it's LS to list the contents of the directory. So if you CD, and that's the same command on MS DOS as well. LS, CD, and you can use just the tab to complete your um, directory, the name of the directory or the file. So there we go. And then if I wanted to look at what that file was, 
I could just type file and it will tell me it's a directory. I could also see that by having a little look using ls minus l or ls minus f. That will give me the file type as well. So a forward slash means it's a directory. So if I go into hello world cdh tab got me into that. I can then use different commands to look at the file as well. So more will show me the file. If it was a longer file, it would page it for me. Cat doesn't page. Cat has a special purpose and I have given you examples on that on one of my other videos. So you have two, you have your different command line interfaces depending on what system you're using. This is my MS-DOS and this is my Linux and they operate slightly differently, but there is a lot of overlap as well. Uh, the commands that I've been using on the Linux system also work on your Mac OS X system. Okay, so the next thing is virtual memory. All of the operating systems use virtual memory and require it in order to swap programs in and out whilst they're being run and also data that the programs are using. So your files, for example. If you are interested in more detail, so you want to delve more into how operating systems work in this respect, a computer science student, for example, then demand paging, demand segmentation, they're just two ways in which data can be put in and out of memory or programs and data can be swapped in and out of memory. From a more practical perspective, I'll just show you again, if you look here, on my Ubuntu, go to the etc directory. There are a lot of configuration files, and one of these files is fs tab file system table. And in there, you will see it's a bit complex when you start looking at these for the first time, but you can see that part of the disk is a swap, is used for swap. All right, and that that's the part of disk that's been reserved for the purpose of memory. So the operating system can work with that very quickly. It can place um, files on there very quickly and load them in and out of memory. So it's a guaranteed bit of space that it's selected for use as extra memory to swap parts of programs in and out when they're not active and data as well. So that's the swap on there. And on Windows, you, you would have to go to control panel and system, so system, in here, and advanced system settings, so they're opening up all over the place, and then here you will see, in terms of performance, you can, it's a bit convoluted, there's your virtual memory, so in the case of mine, it has a paging file. Well, that is a swap file. Or in the case of Windows, it chooses a file, but on Linux, it, it can choose a whole disk or a whole partition on a disk. So that can be manipulated and changed. The same for Linux and Unix systems. You can change that as well, but I won't go into any more detail on that. So cancel all of that and close it. Okay, so virtual memory. couple of little questions for you to think about. So another thing that the operating system does is deals with processes, so programs that are running. And most operating systems nowadays, including mobile phones, will allow you to run more than one program at the same time. So it's quite important for the operating system to be able to manage all of this. So a process is a program that is running that is, is not quite finished. And there are different ways of being able to look at this on your system. So again, if you are on Windows, you can look at Task Manager, which I'm not going to open up this time. But if you're on Linux, you can do PS commands. So PS will show you what processes are running in my user account. So I'm running the terminal <coughs> born again shell and I run the PS command. If I do if I enter PS with everything and full, then I get all of the processes that are running on the system. There's quite a lot there. And you can see I have Apache 2, which is your web, a web server. I have a whole pile of processes that are running. And you, you can actually just pick the ones that you're interested in. 
So I'm just interested in looking at the details of Apache. And top, that gives you the top processes that are running on the system. So there are a number of commands to use, as said, in order to find out what's going on. And in Windows, you would look at Task Manager and Services. So the operating system needs to deal with allocating resources to the process, placing it in the queue while it's waiting for I.O., bringing it back into or out of the queue when it needs to carry on running and so on. Operating systems must be able to access files and control access to them, um, monitor what happens to them, monitor the naming, monitor the storage and may even archive and back them up depending on the system. So in terms of controlling access to files, operating systems need a way of managing the security and the permission structures. So again, using Linux to give you a quick demonstration, I have to log back in. Files in Linux are managed using security permissions that are set. So if you look, every file has a block of permissions. The first here identifies whether it's a link, a symbolic link, an ordinary file which is hash, a directory or there are others as well and then you have permission blocks I wish I could make this a bit bigger but I can't seem to do that so you have permission blocks which are in three in threes so read write execute read not allowed to write but can execute read not allowed to write but can execute and these are in owner group and world so depending on who the owner of the file is and what group you're in as well depends on what you can do to this file so my own files if i do cd to go back to my own area and i enter say dev ls minus l you'll see that myself elaine is able to read write and execute because i'm the owner i'm also in group elaine because by default linux systems when they're just set up using the typical settings will put you in the same group so you'll be you'll have a group called Elaine as well, called your username as well. So group members of Elaine in the group Elaine are also allowed to read, write, execute. But anybody else is only allowed to read or execute, which means to execute means you can change the to the directory. So change to workspace, but you, you cannot do anything else to it. You can't write to it. So all files are the same for my user account. And that's how permissions are managed on the Unix system. On Windows, uh, it's a little bit different. You can set it, set the file permissions and the folder per permissions. But a lot of the time in, in business, you sign into a domain controller and there are access control lists, lists that give um, your profile, set up your profile or hold your profile details. And then when you're on the computer, as long as you're in a certain profile, you can access certain files or you are denied certain permissions. So the, the operating system has to manage all of that. It has to decide whether you're allowed to delete a file or not. It also has to decide whether you can have the same name in, in the same folder, for example, or directory as it's called on Linux. So if I go into Hello World, uh, you'll see a file called hello.c. If I was to try to create a new one called hello.c, or what what will happen with the touch command is that will just make a change to that file. So that's not going to work. I would need to make a new file. So g edit hello um, g edit to make a file. Test. And then I need to save that file. And if I try to save it with the same name, it will just ask me if I want to overwrite it. So it's already exist. You want to replace it. And that's the sort of thing the operating system needs to do. So cancel, cancel. And just close that. Close without saving. And it's the same with the copy command. If I want to copy hello.c to hello.c, it will just complain. So the operating system needs to manage this type of activity. It also needs to know how much storage you have left. We can, we can query most things on a Linux system. 
So for example, we can see the disk usage by DF minus K or H. There are different ways of doing this. You can see the percentage used on your file system. And obviously you can have a look at your folders as well and query those. And on Windows, you can just right click and you see how much space is, is used. But the operating system manages all this using various data structures. OK, so. So I'll finish this overview with a quick comparison of Unix with Windows. Unix systems include Linux and Mac OS X because that's written based on a Unix system as well. They're written in C. They're device independent, so you include additional device drivers if you need to for your specific hardware. You can extend them through shell scripting, which is extremely powerful, and that's dependent on the command interpreter that you, you wish to use as well. They support TCP IP for internet access and various security mechanisms. They have a kernel, which is the core of the system. That does most of the work. They have a, a command interpreter to allow you to interface to the system, which I've already shown you, and a variety of utilities that come with Unix and Linux, quite similar across all of the different variations. And then the applications are added on later. And Windows, this is written in C or C++, and has a hardware abstraction layer as well to keep device independence. Also has a kernel and runs a variety of services in the background, as does Linux, and they're called daemon processes. So those things I'm not going to go into it, into detail with. That's a subject of another video. So hopefully that's given you a good overview. If you want to go into more detail, you'll find there's a it's a massive area. There's whole books just on operating system theory from an academic perspective. You can delve into each of the areas like file management or memory management and explore the different ways in which you can do this. And it's a topic of research, has been for many years. So good luck with exploring operating systems in a lot more detail.